Welcome to FO Live, our signature panel discussion that brings together diverse views from around the world. Today, we bring you the second of our new series brought to you by Fair Observer and the United Service Institution of India, or USI as it is popularly called. Fair Observer is an independent nonprofit media organization that has published more than 2,500 voices from over 90 countries. Anyone can write for us, but everyone goes through a rigorous editorial process. We combine diversity and quality in a way no one else does. So sign up for our free newsletter, subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever is your choice of poison, and publish with us. Our partner, USI, was founded in 1870 by Colonel, later Major General Charles McGregor, for the furtherance of interest and in knowledge in the art, science, and literature of the defense services. With almost 13,000 members, USI is by far the top defense think tank in India. It is an honor to have USI as a partner of Fair Observer. I will now hand you over to my erudite and eminent USI friend, Major General B.K. Sharma. He's the director of USI. So take it away, Herr General. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Atulji. I think it's a great privilege to be in partnership with you to run these discourses on some very vital strategic issues. And we have a council member, Admiral Sinha, who also represents uh, USI perhaps more than I do. And he's always been sort of, you know, on request. Whenever I request him, he's sort of made his, his expertise available to us. And what is more, uh, I would say, uh, I would say uh, makes me immensely happy is the two top-notch uh, strategic thinkers uh, who are very world uh, famous and everybody's been following them. So we are not actually going to state the obvious or in our discourse, you know, discuss the foregone conclusions. I think everybody is uh, watching all the trends and what is happening in our COVID impacted world. What kind of strategic brinkmanship we are watching. Some people call it the new Cold War. What has happened in Eurasia post the US withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan, how the new geopolitical alignments are forging there. Likewise, in West Asia, we know what are the existing flashpoints, but there, there is a new dispensation which has come into the being. And that is what you call is the West Asian Quad, uh, which comprises India, US, Israel, and UAE. It has its own implications. But we all know that uh, the melting pot of the new world order or the strategic brinkmanship is the Indo-Pacific for obvious reasons. There are geographical reasons, there are economic reasons. I'll not delve into those reasons. Those are very well known. And we also know that, well, there is a reigning resident part, United States of America, which has a huge heft in the security arena. And there is a challenger, a major world power, that is China, which has made great inroads into the economic space, be it RCEP, Asia, infrastructure, investment bank, be it BRI, maritime silk route, and such like other things. Now, at the moment, the whole con this competition devolves around the three Cs. Uh, we have at one level competition, then we, there are elements of cooperation, and you, that, then you have contestation over domination of locations, resources, trade, technology, security, which has both components, the non-traditional security threats. And you have the traditional security where disruptive technology-driven arms race is in full swing. Now, those are some of the things. Now, United States of America is trying to mend that Euro-Atlantic alliance, probably give a new avatar to NATO. Uh, likewise, it is also trying to whip up or re-energize the 
uh, Eurasian, uh, sorry, the East Asian Alliance system. And now we have two more dispensation which have come to the fore. On one side, we have Quad, and while it was taking some shape, we have now the AUKUS, which has come up there. In the meanwhile, uh, you see, no matter whether we like it or not, Pax Americana has lost some of his sheen. Likewise, Pan Seneca is not also a very popular model for the world to follow. So as a result, the middle level path and the smaller path, they are actually following a very calibrated alignment and realignment policy, which devolves around hedging, binding and balancing. So we are not very clear in which direction are we really heading. And so to say, are we really into a VOCA world, which is characterized by volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. So it is in this context that we want to discuss some of these burning issues today. And we would begin with first is what are the major takeaways from the recently concluded Quad Summit? And what, in your view, is the prognosis of uh, Quad? And I would request a, a, a very crisp response from Mr. Christopher. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think there are the usual takeaways that people have discussed, the 1.2 billion doses of COVID vaccine uh, manufactured by Biological E, an Indian firm. They talked about climate change, terrorism, 5G, other technologies, a fellowship program, a, a pretty dizzying variety uh, of issues. But what struck me is that it's a values-based group. Uh, if you look at the joint statement, they mentioned things like democratic values, rule of law, uh, undaunted by coercion really caught my eye. So it was a pretty clear indication that it was directed toward China. Uh, and I do think that that joint statement is worth a read. Uh, it's not a NATO type defense agreement. Um, it's values based. And when you look at so many other alliances, you look at Iran, Venezuela, uh, Russia, China, uh, what do they really have to do with each other aside from momentary strategic value? And, and in my opinion, nothing really undergirds that. But in the case of the Quad, it's loose and it's open but it allows for a variety of issues to be addressed. So the possibilities are greater, uh, but there's also the problem of focus. Um, but I viewed the quad as more of a, uh, the summit rather, as more of a public announcement of coordinated uh, efforts. Uh, these efforts have been going on for some time, but this formalized it and it was a little bit like, um, telling the world there was more behind the scenes than just passing notes in class saying, I like you. Um, it also recognized India as a major strategic partner. And, and one of the things I hope that comes of this is a curtailing of what I see as a um, public dismissiveness of India. Lately, I've, I've taken to asking uh, my friends, how many people uh, are in India relative to China? And the general sense is that China is really, really big and India's kind of big too, um, but people are shocked when I say that the populations are roughly equal and India's growing and its economy is growing. But the summit um, ex post facto is already beginning to pay dividends. Uh, I'll draw your attention to a couple of days ago, three Republican senators, and including my home state, uh, Ted Cruz, introduced a bill to exempt the Quad members from a decade of sanctions for purchasing the S-400 uh, Russian missile system in the case of India. And the reasoning was the importance of India uh, relative to facing the China threat. And uh, interestingly, this bill came uh, hard on the heels of a letter that was sent to President Biden earlier this week from senators calling for a waiver on the grounds of national security. My other uh, home state senator, uh, Senator Cornyn, uh, was on that letter as well. So my hope is moving forward that the quad members will realize this is a collection of equals and they will embrace a diversity of issues. They've already laid the groundwork for that. And I think it has a lot of room to run in that regard. Uh, thank you, Christopher. Uh, I've just got a follow-up question here. You know, as per Asia Development Bank, the entire 
requirement of infrastructure in Asia is to the tune of $27 trillion. Now, mm -hmm. China has brought a lot of money in the Belt and Road Initiative, right? And most of these developing or underdeveloped countries are looking for major infrastructure investments in their countries, right? Now, how are we going to match in Quad? One of the subcomponents of Quad is, you know, infrastructure development. From where that money is going to come to match up with the Chinese investment? I mean, when I talk about prognosis, this is the most critical element of, of Quad, that how are we going to deliver on that particular front? Well, I think in the case of China and infrastructure, uh, as they say, if you make a deal with the devil, you're sure to be the junior partner. So I think a lot of countries will realize that the deals they made may not be that great. Uh, in terms of funding these things, look at what the UN is saying. Uh, there's not enough funding from the wealthier nations to support the poorer nations. It seems like a lot of commitments are made. The follow-up is always in question. Where is that money going to come to come from? Specifically, a number that large, it's hard to say. So I think there is a loose framework. There are general commitments, but it's the same question, the same problem uh, we'll see at COP26 in the coming days. And that those obligations are easy to make, but hard to live up to. I don't see any concrete terms uh, that have been laid out for where that money comes from uh, and who's going to give how much. But it's a massive, massive, in my opinion, unrealistic number. Uh, I know that's an unsatisfying response, but uh, I don't see how we get to that kind of number in a world where everyone's sort of grappling for large numbers, not just pocket change. And indeed, a concern of mine is that America is spending like a drunken sailor right now. Uh, I'm not sure we have the room to run to donate that kind of money or, or contribute that kind of money to those efforts. Uh, and I think those discussions are ongoing. Uh, thank you for that response. Uh, we would follow it up a little later. Now, the second issue that we need to discuss is this emergence of AUKUS. And in that, particularly the circumstances in which AUKUS uh, took birth uh, was what Joe Biden has called very recently that we were very clumsy in dealing with it and the kind of explanation that he rendered. I mean, that was little, I mean, very humorous, I would say, to, to an extent. But let me refer to uh, Frederick, that what do you think actually has led to emergence of uh, AUKUS? And uh, will it cost its shadow on the intent of uh, President Joe Biden to re-energize the uh, Euro-Atlantic Alliance. How, how this is going to be balanced? Your views on this? Well, I don't know if it's going to cast a shadow, but it certainly did raise some questions. I mean, there are several dimensions to all this. On the one side says, well, vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, the US is back. And this is a message which has been welcomed by everybody in Europe. Uh, France included, to be honest. But then there is the way everything has been made. And this is a very bizarre thing to say on the one side, well, we want everybody on board and everybody follows our lead. And on the other side, uh, it the one country which in Europe was trying to pull everybody in the alliance and in the same direction. So, you know, for uh, if you ask Europeans, the first dimension will prevail for most of them. That is, this is the message that America is back. And for the French, America is back. But what kind of policies are trying to follow? You know, this is a very bizarre way to uh, say, well, let's line up against, uh, against China and at the same time weaken the alliance because the only strategic link between the Europe and the Indo-Pacific region was precisely false. So that's the way it's been received and that's the kind of question that I, it did raise in Europe. Now, there are other questions as well, related in part to uh, what AUKUS will really be about because everybody took it at face value. We actually don't know what's really going to be within AUKUS. 
you know, and the three countries which are part of the arrangement, the US, Australia, and the UK, have given themselves 18 months to decide. So I'm sure there will be things, of course, and I do not intend to be negative because of the impact on the French uh, submarine and so on. But the fact is, they have traded something which was going on for something which is highly uncertain right now, with a certain, certainly a strong delay in the delivery of the submarines because the first one will be delivered at best in 2040. The question is, if you send a strong message on the one side, what do you expect the adversary will do in between this time? Given the fact also that yes, military is definitely a central dimension of all this, but at the same time, overwhelming US superiority in the naval field never prevented China to get where it is right now. So this is a set of questions which hasn't been answered by anybody so far in the enthusiasm or the anger against August. Uh, and this is where we stand right now. And there is such a level of uncertainty regarding everything that I don't think we can make any definitive comments about. So thank you. And I have a follow-up question now. Uh, while this AUKUS is still uh, crystallizing, there are two yeah. new issues which have been thrown up. One is to find a new mandate for NATO. And particularly, you know, the kind of statements that we've been hearing is that about about as it is NATO was uh, made to counter or balance Russia. But increasingly, we find a mention of China. Is it that in due course of time, NATO too is going to be a counter China kind of a alliance? And then if NATO is reinvented, what, are, what is this talk about a Eurasia, uh, uh, European security architecture or new a security system for uh, Europe? Well, I don't think we're spoken of a new security system. There has been talk forever about uh, European defense, but that's something else. It basically means that the Europeans should assume a greater share of the defense burden for themselves in order to be able to wait in NATO's decision and in the relation with the US. This has never been thought as any anti-US whatever you can imagine, as is, it has sometimes been presented here and there. Uh, so, and the fact that NATO will become uh, or would become an anti-China thing. I mean, that discussion about China, I don't think that NATO is in any way ready for that kind of uh, transition, at least not right now. And uh, this is something which is gonna be discussed, but this is not, uh, the, the priority of the moment and isn't likely to become the priority of the moment. That creates all sorts of problems as well. And that creates all sorts of problems because many Europeans, I would just, uh, uh, through the uh, External Action Service, released a new strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, to use the exact title of the text, did go for it precisely because in a way they were buying or trying or thinking that they were buying some uh, uh, security regarding US commitment to Europe security. Uh, the kind of message that AUKUS did send into it, although it was definitely not contradictory to the message that the Europeans were themselves trying to find, but it, put, it did put the European in a very strange situation where they don't know where to stay. And that's where probably the question that you ask about NATO comes in because it's in thing as a sort of a risk of marginalization on the one side without any further guarantee on the other side. So if you were European, where would you place yourself? That's the question that everybody's asking. And that's something that the thinking about that has just started. And this is something which is likely to evolve over time. Rest assured that nobody wants to be in any sort of tension with the US. That was never the case. And that is unlikely to be the case anytime soon. Nevertheless, the way the US behave, which in many ways is the continuation of Trumpism by another name, because it goes by, uh, it, it, it amounts to saying that, you know, America will go alone, despite all the talk about uh, a collection of equal, the, the primus inter pares or whatever, 
if the reality is the US, what the US is doing right now is asking for complete alignment and not really cooperation, which is likely different. And that's something that is gonna likely to make a number of countries uneasy. Many will be ready to accept, of course, to cooperate and nobody wants to not cooperate with the US for obvious uh, reason of convergence of interest and so on, but at what cost and to do what exactly. So we are in the middle of all this and I have no uh, definitive answer to give you today. I'm sorry if it's frustrating, but that's the reality. Thank you. Thank you for that very advanced uh, response. Uh, and uh, now we actually move on to uh, India's role in uh, Quad. Uh, we know that, well, we have uh, a very serious standoff with Chinese at the line of actual control. And on top of that, Chinese have not now passed that new, you know, border law in which they are going to up the ante and probably we are ending up with the status quo. Now, what are our expectations, uh, Admiral Sina, from Quad and uh, from AUKUS in, in regard to balancing China? Uh, what are the risks? Uh, what are the prospects? Could you please enlighten us on that? Well, thank you, Jill Sharma, and thank you, Atul, for uh, getting me here on this discussion. And I think it's a very important issue for as far as India is concerned. Uh, what Christopher said, I just want to add two, two more things in the joint working group, uh, which has emerged after the summit level meeting. And one is cybersecurity, another one is the space group. And there, the space group talks about sharing of satellite data. Well, it says for uh, you know capacity building of sustainable development, but you know, there is an underlying sort of uh, military application of the satellites. Now, as far as uh, border tension is concerned, Jim Sharma, my sense is uh, that India has to fight its own war if there is one. Uh, expectation from Quad, my, my sense is that South Block is very clear uh, that the Quad will probably uh, provide the areas in which we are cooperating as Quad. For example, sharing of intelligence, for example, capacity building, for example, uh, giving you platforms of new technology and how to use it. Uh, and that's already happening. And we saw that during the Eastern Ladakh uh, standoff the last time that we did have a fair amount of intelligence, uh, you know, uh, intelligence sharing. Uh, but uh, coming to AUKUS and what impact does it have? I think that's, that's what, uh, you know, I will take it from where Frederick uh, stopped. Uh, essentially, my sense is that it is a very much a military alliance. Uh, there is going to be transfer of very sensitive uh, technology by the US to Australia. And it is not very soon that's going to happen. It will be at least uh, 10 years to my sort of mind, whatever little I understand of submarine building. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, UK having come, uh, you know, in, the, in that uh, AUKUS, as you know, the, the astute class nuclear submarine has only just arrived already, I think, yesterday in, uh, in Australia. And uh, I would guess that it is there to uh, do the training, both operational and uh, technical training as to how to maintain and how to run a nuclear submarine for which the Australians, this will be a totally new thing. And also probably identify the uh, medium and small sort of enterprises uh, who will make the components so that it can be sustained over a period of 40, 50 years. Uh, that is one. I also suspect that sooner or later, either the Americans or the Royal Navy, they will lease a nuclear submarine to the Australians so that it should not look a very distant dream and China should become very aggressive in the meantime. So that is one uh, very big issue, which I, I think that you know, this is what is going to happen. Whereas as far as Quad is concerned, Quad is actually not impacted with this at all. As far as India is concerned, I think it's a, it's a complementary. That because India has been taking a stand that it is all inclusive and there is no military component, possibly this may have also pushed US to make a, a complete military alliance from the Pacific side. And uh, as you rightly said, you know that America has uh, hastily come out of Afghanistan uh, and to lift its own image in the world, Possibly it has, it has done the AUKUS at this point in time. I believe the discussions were going on since June. Why have they chosen this time to sign AUKUS? Uh, at, the, at the risk of uh, upsetting uh, France, which uh, Frederick talked about. 
but there are there are things which are happening so i think that you know there is uh, uh, as far as board is concerned india is only going to get the softer part of military uh, for you know for making a picture and for holding on to the chinese uh, because geographically you you are an army man you know that place better then geographically we are much better off in many many places and uh, china will not like to get into full fledged war i know the 13th round of talk has failed but i think that is not end of everything uh, because the channels are still open so two short uh, sentences that i will say uh, that from quad uh, delhi expects that agreements which are in place if they can be used for improving our general situational awareness on the border we should be able to hold on give us the uh, platforms which are of higher technology and absorb it number 2 and number 3 is that also it is uh, it is a good idea that not only us uh, but australia and japan with them also we have very similar kind of uh, you know agreements uh, so that you know we can make use of that aukas well right now i don't think that it has any impact on quad a lot of people are saying that you know it is actually going to marginalize quad i don't think so these two are really uh, really uh, not connected at the moment because quad military uh, you know component is not plugged in as yet uh, though uh, when talking to naval chief uh, you know he mentioned uh, indian naval chief uh, that you know where is the doubt that they will be plug and play but we don't know whether there's no official sort of uh, statement there uh, but day before yesterday the foreign secretary has made it very clear that you don't have any military component in the quad so i'll stop there and maybe later on you can have some question uh, no i'll just ask a follow up question here uh, there are some writings here that well if americans could give nuclear submarines uh, to australia indian navy is much bigger and much in a much better position to balance china why such kind of an offer has not been made to india and second can, can issue here is will india be uh, open to joining aukus in times to come or will is such an offering uh, offer in the offing or not um, i i don't think so you know as there are there are some writings to suggest uh, that america has chosen uh, australia and uk because they are very old allies uh, some people have gone to the extent of saying that it is uh, basically the anglo saxon alliance and therefore france has been left out Uh, but i don't i do i suspect that you know that that is more of a more of a speculation than anything uh, but if you look at pacific uh, general sharma i look at indo pacific as very three distinct sections i have been saying it in many of the seminars including the ones you have chaired in the past uh, you see there is a very clear indian ocean there is very clear south china sea east sea and that part and very clear pacific and if you see all this the naval component of the pacific the australians the naval assets are not adequate i will say it very frankly and therefore giving a nuclear submarine technology and leasing nuclear submarine actually makes task of us that much easier so that it doesn't have to actually monitor such a huge area of indo pacific i have been suggesting even from the side of your side please don't look at it as one section look at it as three section look at india as a regional power on indian ocean and what you have right now the geographical advantage and the military power maritime power india should be for next 6 7 years i think we should be able to uh, hold on to china and in the meantime i am sure these softer issues which are following up as part of quad uh, that should start uh, showing results thank you sir thank you and now let's get on to the most volatile flash point in the indo pacific and taiwan we heard the statements made by president xi jinping uh, we also had certain assurances from president jo- joe biden though l- later on there was little bit of a dilution of on his assertion and in the meanwhile you know what chinese are doing actually it's a very dangerous maneuver in 150 aircraft you know getting into the air defense identification zone so which way are we heading i mean how is this whole thing going to is it another thusi died strap that this is really going to be the uh, the beginning of the uh, new world war how do you lo- look at this because i think both sides are testing the waters and uh, whether it will remain capped up to that level or there is a, 
a real chance of an accidental flare up which goes up the escalation ladder christopher thank you sir uh first of all with regard to that uh, follow up by biden about uh, the handling of aukus being clumsy he went on to further say that he was under the impression that the friend which i thought was sort of clumsy on biden's part uh, sort of threw the Australians under the uh, the bus, as it were. Uh, in terms of uh, Thucydides' trap, uh, you know, that's a little bit strong for me. Uh, everyone's talking about Taipei, uh, Taiwan, all of that, and, and, and the jet overflies. But let's also keep in mind what recently happened, uh, the intimidation of Japan. Uh, Chinese and Russian warships are pushing, and these weren't fishing vessels like we've seen in the past. I mean, this was a clear message. Uh, and in the up is down world, uh, it was justified by saying that it was meant to, these exercises were meant to ensure international and regional stability. But who's really making it volatile? Uh, the other thing about this was the hypocrisy of it all. My grandmother used to say, do as I say, and not as I do. And that appears to be the case uh, with the Chinese and the Russians. Uh, they condemn navigation through the Taiwan Strait as destabilizing. But the Asumi Strait, uh, vastly smaller, narrower, uh, that's apparently open game. Uh, with regard to Taiwan, it seems that the US is maintaining its policy, uh, longtime policy of strategic ambiguity, uh, which if you watch the town hall is so ambiguous, President Biden uh, didn't quite grasp it. Um, but uh, this policy uh, with or without it, it's still, the Chinese still have to be more forceful than they were. Uh, they don't have the, the capability of being subtle like the Russians could over Crimea and Georgia, uh, claiming, well, the, the population there really wants us. Uh, it's very clear, a uh, recent uh, survey, 87% of Taiwanese want the status quo. Uh, so they have to be a little bit more overt. From the American perspective and what our obligations are, the question has arisen recently as to what sacrifice the Taiwanese uh, are willing to make themselves to retain uh, the precarious independence they have. Uh, the notion that the Americans will save us doesn't really wash well over here, uh, but nor does bullying. Uh, when the Chinese said uh, that the Americans were the first to go in an assault on Taiwan, that rubbed people the wrong way. Uh, but I don't think it's so much as a trap as at present, China is trying to distract from domestic problems, uh, particularly in the real estate market. However, I think their ultimate goal is still the same. Uh, I do think that the people who are predicting a very short timeline are probably right. Uh, a lot of Xi's moves have instilled fear. Uh, that leads to surrounding yourself with yes men and that commonly leads to hubris and mistakes can be made. But um, it's also worth noting neither, neither side sees time on its side. Um, quite right, the investments of the submarines uh, do not look uh, to come through until the latter end of this decade. Uh, I think it is prescient to predict that there will be a submarine right. loan of some kind to shore up um, that, you know, some, some military and defense capabilities. Um, but I don't think that there's necessarily Thucydides trap there. Uh, I do think the circumstances are ripe for errors, mistakes, um, and the Chinese government, uh, the, the heads don't lie easily over there. And though ostensibly that government looks strong, uh, underneath I get the sense it's very brittle. And she making such enormous moves, I think is also creating further instability. Well, uh, when we talk about uh, certain responses there, what, what is worrisome here is that uh, there is a, a history of a strategic mistrust, uh, which is then complemented by ultra-nationalism, particularly in China. And the third factor is there are no instrumentalities or mechanisms in place for conflict prevention and conflict aversion there. I think we need to work on this so that there's a better confidence building measures uh, to avert any accidental shootout 
which can lead to a real military confrontation. Uh, and that brings me to the next question, and that is, what is uh, Russia up to in the Indo-Pacific in the light of, you know, this uh, bad wagoning with, uh, uh, with the Chinese vessels in the Sea of Japan very recently, uh, when they made certain maneuvers there. And likewise, in the past also, uh, Russian aircraft, fighter aircraft have actually intruded into the South Korean airspace. They were chased out. There have been instances of they intruding into the Japanese uh, airspace, and they have uh, deliberately kept the, this issue or dispute of Kuril Island hanging. So in the light of this, what role do you see for Russia? Frederick, may I have your comments, please? Well, uh, I'm afraid the role that I see for Russia is a highly destructive one. I'm not sure what kind of ambition Russia may have in the Indo-Pacific, but wherever they go, they are not exactly behaving like or seen as a stabilizing force, be it in Africa, be it in the Indo-Pacific, be it just anywhere. Uh, I'm not sure that it's a good thing. I mean, as you know, President Macron in 2019 uh, clearly said that he wanted to keep the dialogue open despite all the differences. And believe me, the differences have not changed and have not moved, but we haven't seen any progress on that side. So we see a Russia which tends to align with China on many fronts. Actually, the idea that the relation was uneasy between the two uh, is probably true. But at the same time, so far, all we have seen is China and uh, Russia getting closer and closer and closer in whatever can be seen as an anti, uh, as anti Western moves, be it in the Indo Pacific and clearly in. Uh, in Afghanistan as well, but elsewhere also, uh, and so on. So what can be expected from it? I don't know, but it doesn't seem to me that Russia can be expected to go in the right direction as far as our interests are concerned in the uh, foreseeable future. At least they don't seem to take the direction right now. Thank you, thank you very much. And now I, I actually get back to Admiral Sinha. Uh, Admiral Sinha, uh, in this balance of power, uh, what is the end state that uh, you, in your visualization, the Chinese have in mind? And what kind of long-term strategy they are likely to pursue? They've already virtually created a, a China-centric economic order in Asia. But in the security domain, they are quite weak, even though they are expanding their Navy in a very big way and they're creating other disruptive technology-based uh, capabilities. But in the long run, what strategy do you visualize they are going to follow? Uh, let's give a perspective of a, let's give a perspective of a decade or so. Well, uh, I think I think uh, China has, you know, uh, wrongly or rightly has assumed that time for China has come uh, to tell the world that they have arrived. Um, just a little bit early, because uh, that was very clear last year. Uh, it, Chair, you will recall the, uh, you know, when the Ladakh standoff was going on, they also had a problem in uh, Hong Kong. They also had issue in the Taiwan Strait all at the same time. Um, and I think, uh, you know, they messed up virtually all of it. Uh, I mean, they didn't succeed. I don't, I shouldn't say they messed up. But I think the manner in which they are going, the ultimate aim is to uh, push the U.S. out from the both the island chains so that uh, you know they can have a free run into uh, South China Sea and the Pacific and subsequently in the Indian Ocean. Otherwise, they need not have uh, started uh, running a base in Subuti and by and large a base in Gwadar and they're looking for some more on the east coast of Africa. Uh, so I think the broader aim, the long-term aim is to uh, have the, as you rightly said, you know, Sinocentric world. I would say that, you know, they, they would like to, um, uh, in fact, the General Secretary Xi Jinping in the, in the 19th Congress, he mentioned uh, that here is a model of development. We have pulled out 600 million people out of poverty. Uh, and this is a model which, you know, you should look at rather than your chaotic democracy. Uh, which doesn't seem to, uh, you know, uh, give the results that uh, you expected. And he gives example of many other countries. 
so i think the the ultimately the uh, intention of the communist party of china is to have a, a some kind of a single party uh, dominion in the world uh, and they want to dominate the eurasian landmass and take the business right up to through the bri right up to africa and control the indo pacific uh, area so that their energy lines are secured so i think the short of the long is that they actually want to become the world's most powerful country both economically and uh, militarily and my own sense is uh, general sharma is that uh, whenever you have a established system as a student of political science whenever you have a established system where there is unipolarity uh, where the economic and military power leadership is with one country you have a some sense of stability because everybody knows as to who's going to be the big boss uh, but now you are coming to a situation where uh, china is about to push the us out of uh, uh, the economic leadership though i believe that it is still some time it is nowhere close to uh, the economy of uh, america a lot of people are saying it will happen soon but i have i have uh, my own doubts uh, so when you have the economic leadership with one country and military leadership with other this turmoil will continue you will have this geopolitical turbulence till such time it stabilizes and i think that uh, it's very unlikely to stabilize in the near very near future to my mind and uh, and therefore uh, in in the bigger game that we are actually going to see this uh, going into a very long drawn uh, not so cold war but a cold war whether in america agrees or not and in between which you mentioned a very wise thing about the middle past it will uh, allow the middle powers like you know australia japan uh, india maybe maybe indonesia in this part of the world uh, to come together and have a developmental model where the chinese also begin to believe that democracy may be you know justice delayed but it justice not denied uh, it takes time decision making in democracy is the most chaotic method of uh, making make taking decision we know it and one of the reasons why the quad is now homing on to the infrastructure and you mentioned that there is a lot of money required i agree but it is a transparent system it is a sustainable method of doing infrastructure development it may take time but people will be very confident that nobody is you know cheating nobody is you know putting is putting us in debt trap so those are the advantages which you have to weigh against doing it very quickly so i think all in all Uh, china has already influenced very large number of countries and the democracies will try and resist the rise of china both economically and militarily by creating these hurdles so china may have intention but uh, uh, i suspect that you know is they're not going to succeed very quickly uh, thank you thank you sir uh, my question a follow up question on this particular issue is to frederick Uh, 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 you see Ch- uh, uh, america still remains a formidable power in terms of its size mm-hmm. of its economy uh, in terms of its uh, technological prowess in terms of you know the goodwill still it enjoys with most of the countries now and given the interdependence and complementarity in their relations between china and us is there a possibility of the two countries arriving at a new modus vivendi uh, maybe 10 years down the line and likewise what role the middle powers can play in in balancing out as uh, admiral sina has alluded to may i have your views on this well you know about your first question the the short answer is i don't know and i'm definitely uh, not an astral germany kind possibility of a g2 is something which has been uh, which has been discussed for some time and things are not really taking that direction now i can see your point because we see a lot of intimidation on both sides and the cost increasing on both sides potential cost of conflict increase on both sides and not so long ago we could say okay us china conflict this is very low probability but very high cost and because of low probability there was a large room for discussion and so on and today this probability the, the level of probability has increased which means that the the space for discussion has also decreased which is a worrying trend uh, so we're definitely not at a period of time where this possibility of uh, um, 
uh, what sort of an entente between the two is likely to emerge. In 10 years from now, I don't know. Uh, and I will not pretend that I will uh, see a clear pass in that direction. I do not exclude it because as I said, the two countries have realized, will soon realize that the, the potential cost of, uh, of their rivalry is probably uh, uh, more than they can bear over a certain, uh, uh, over the long time. I don't remember really what was the second aspect, well, the, the second part of your question. Uh, oh yes, the... the the middle the, level the, powers. The, the middle powers and so on. Well, it's for the middle powers to find not a third way. I mean, clearly, you know, this this is a kind of catchphrase that doesn't mean much because everybody is more or less uh, on the side of the US when things come to shove. And not just because of tragic interest. In terms of lifestyle, in terms of value, there is a more commonality there than they will ever be with China in any way. But what would make sense for middle powers and what they're actually trying to do is to find a way to um, change, the, change the narrative, make sure that we can, in some sense, constrain China into more acceptable norms of behavior. And that involves uh, work at many different levels, not very glamorous, not very spectacular, highly political in nature, but not just political in nature, putting up structures where uh, actually uh, we mobilize public opinions in and around the Indo-Pacific, like the Chinese have done so, so successfully at the very beginning of the BRI. We speak of Indian governance, of a, sorry, Indian Ocean governance, for example, and there are a lot of things that can be done to make sure that China will still be an actor there, but will not have the, time, the same space to operate. Uh, and where its popularity and influence will decrease precisely because at some point it will have no choice but to comply with international norms. Uh, and there are things as trivial from a strategic perspective that fisheries, for example, which are suddenly becoming so important and look at the, 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 the role it plays, for example, in the South China Sea, but also in the East China Sea, I mean, Japan had to push away some 80, uh, eight, 80 uh, Chinese trawlers recently. And the similar situation, also in different circumstances, is happening now in the Indian Ocean. And that's just one example of the kind of thing that can be done. Again, not spectacular, not glamorous, and likely to bring a lot of international attention, but very important in nature. And you use uh, I mentioned fisheries, you can use a lot of other things for which we could do, a, 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 we could do much more than we could train China, isolate it when need be, and, and move this way without being openly hostile, not even hostile at all, but pushing them in what we believe is the right direction. Thank you. Thank you for that very comprehensive response. And my last question is to Christopher. You have worked with the Congress. You have also been at the Pentagon. And uh, we hopefully see you uh, in the Senate one day. And who knows that well, uh, you become one of the top-notch thought leaders of your country. Now, if you were given a kind of a free will, what would be those key tenets of uh, balancing China's strategy? Because it is United States of America which has to be in the driving seat, right? So if we have to spell out such a strategy, what would be its key tenets? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I think the first thing to recognize is that China recognizes uh, force more than anything. Uh, they seem to perceive much of anything else as weakness. Um, interestingly, I took an international law class and frequently I would contradict the professor. He would say, well, it's going to go this according to international norms. And I'd say, but that's not what they're going to do. Um, and some students came up to me and, uh, said, you know, I like what you say. And I got to talking to them. And then there was another person who came up and, uh, I said, well, what do you do? And they said, we work for the Chinese embassy. So they were clearly interested in somebody who um, was a little bit on to them. Uh, so, you know, they, they, they may not always adhere to these international norms. Uh, I am reminded of uh, uh, the promises 
I remember being on the Hill at this time, that China would not militarize the artificial islands. And look at what we have there. In terms of past promises, um, you know, look at the Sino Declaration over Hong Kong. I mean, it lasts for 50 years and we got 17 years. By 2014, they said that was effectively null and void. So I think you have to keep that in mind. There have been kerfuffle. They say, no, nah, we don't really like it, so we're not going to do it. Uh, so in negotiating with the Chinese, uh, they frequently want to take up a lot of time. The Trump administration faced this, and their negotiators would come home and say, they just talked and talked and talked. And then they'd go home, and they'd parse whatever language was ironed out, read it in a favorable light toward China. Uh, and then the Americans would say, wait, 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 guys, we, we already, you know, or gals, we already talked about this. That's not, that was not our read. That's not what we thought we agreed upon. So uh, we don't want to get sucked into endless negotiations. And so the question is, why do they negotiate uh, at all uh, if they really don't have any intention of settling anything? And uh, I think they think the West likes this, that, that, that it resonates. Uh, she talks a good deal about climate change, but he won't be at uh, COP26. Um, in terms of concrete actions, um, I think uh, it is accurate to say that a lot of the unsexy stuff will be uh, where the game is played. We've talked about infrastructure uh, and how that deeply resonates. Um, we've talked about um, um, smaller maritime operations. The US has been using its Coast Guard in many cases uh, with smaller nations who feel threatened. Um, but I think action uh, speaks louder than words. Uh, moving carrier groups uh, into the region uh, really speaks volumes. Uh, I think increasing naval interoperability in the region is, is an interesting step. Um, we've talked a lot about technology transfers of various kinds or cooperative technology uh, ventures. Um, but the big question right now is, do we porcupine, as they're saying, uh, Taiwan? Taiwan has spent heavily in, um, you know, the big sexy stuff, but uh, the time for a military buildup is pretty narrow. And uh, talking about submarines and all that, it's great. It's a decade off, and that's sucking a lot of oxygen out of the room. Uh, do we sell Taiwan? Um, smaller things? Do we sell them anti-ship missiles and sea mines and uh, really make them ready in here and now? Another interesting question is uh, intellectual property. I followed this for a long time. It is extraordinary to see the, uh, the, the, the volume and the depth and breadth of the theft that occurred. For a while, uh, congressional staffers would go on staff delegation trips to China and their blackberries, which we carried at the time, would come back full of all kinds of junk and they'd have to be stripped down and, and built up. But I think protecting and expanding technology investments uh, with our partners uh, is another way to go about it. Um, I think we've seen where Huawei uh, has been hit pretty hard by sanctions. And, and I think some of, uh, some of those efforts um, by uh, both administrations, the Trump and the Biden administration have been effective. Uh, I think AUKUS is, is a key component, as, as is the Quad, and continue building up those cooperative efforts. And from the, uh, there are existential issues to the Japanese, to uh, the Taiwanese, and, and a variety of other allies. But from the U.S., we have to realize that if Taiwan falls, the dashes and lines and all that, 9, 12, whatever it is now, uh, that will become much more complicated and um, we're going to have to show some real resolve and do this with demonstrative uh, action. Uh, but a lot of the less interesting, less sexy stuff is where this game will be played. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, building up back channels, there is a history of strategic mistrust. So uh, I hope that there is um, uh, some way that we can build up those communicative avenues. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Admiral Sina, I'll just get, get back to you. And uh, one last thing that I want to say, shouldn't United States of America think big and drive a wedge into this uh, alliance between, United St uh, between China and Russia? They have inherent fault lines in their relationship. And rather than pushing them into each other, orbit in each other's arms? Can they be a 
strategic uh, reset of uh, weaning away Russia from China? Yes, Christopher. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Would you repeat that? I, I, I no, thought you I were say, directing it elsewhere. Can, can, can they be one of the prongs of American strategy be that you drive a wedge between US, uh, Russia and China relationship? They have inherent fault lines in, within their own relationship. I think so. Uh, earlier, I mentioned how a lot of these uh, alliances, alliances don't really have anything that undergirds them beyond the opportunity of the moment. Um, you know, I've long thought that there is a natural tension, certainly a border tension between Russia and China. Uh, and if I were Russia, uh, which seems to punch above its weight on the international stage right now, I would be worried about China's expansionary ambitions. So I think there are some wedges to drive. Um, Russia's interests economically are more Western oriented in energy. And well, that's a topic for another day, a very interesting and lengthy one. But I think there are some wedges. However, what will principally unify China and Russia is an interest in destabilizing America. And it's kind of hard to come up with something uh, more appealing than tweaking the nose of America. Uh, but indeed, where we see those opportunities, and they may arise, we should certainly take them. Thank you so much. A Admiral Sina, sir, you had something to say? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to, just to uh, supplant what uh, Christopher has mentioned, uh, that uh, while soft talk with uh, China, softer things should continue. I'm not denying that. Uh, but China understands uh, the power of the gun. And therefore, not only should we be having a big naval exercises and presence in Taiwan Strait, I think that uh, having power is one issue and demonstrating the will to use it is more important. And that is what China understands. And I think you must demonstrate to China that we have the will to uh, use it. And therefore, all these movements of aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines are all important. Uh, the second point I wanted to make was that yesterday, uh, the, the uh, State Department spokesperson, I think, uh, when, when she or he was asked uh, that, how about Taiwan? Uh, the answer was that we have, a, we have an act and we have a pact uh, that if the sovereignty of Taiwan is being threatened, we will pitch in. So there's no doubt about it. And I believe that uh, President Biden also few days back somewhere he's made this statement. So I think that uh, uh, this ambiguity is becoming less and less ambiguous um, and uh, possibly it should be just left as that. Uh, let, let China believe, let the PRC believe that uh, America will not pitch in bandwagon. But I think that, uh, you know, it can really trigger a very bigger war if China tries to actually physically capture Taiwan. And uh, to say that Taiwan is, uh, uh, Taiwan is no uh, small pushover, it's, uh, you know, it's too, too far advanced in the cyber technology. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, the uh, aircraft and ships which are, uh, you know, roaming around in that area, um, many things get disabled because of the cyber intervention. Uh, most of these, uh, uh, you know, flying by the aircraft has been done in the southwest corner. They follow a particular pattern. I've got some diagrams here of uh, day before yesterday or a week back when 150 odd aircraft were there, uh, that is one. But what the Taiwan, Taiwan is most worried uh, that they may use uh, commercial aircraft and commercial ships uh, to do, do this military actions uh, onto Taiwan. And that, that is what worries them a little more than actually a military aircraft and military ships. So I thought I'll just add this to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I think we're running out of time. Atulji, are there any questions that you would like uh, to sort of uh, address to the to the panelists? Yes, it would be great to pick up some questions. We have a question from Stephen Elman um, uh, from California, one of the tech superstars in Silicon Valley, one of the young tech superstars. And he says that China has a very complex border situation. Um, he thinks uh, it has 14 bordering countries. Now, will this complex border situation limit Chinese expansion or does causality run in the opposite direction? 
its expansionist foreign policy is actually an attempt at securing this border. Uh, uh, would you like to say, sir, or I could even answer? Uh, I, I, I think the chair, the chair is the best suited person for this. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I, I think, uh, you see, Chinese have already resolved their boundary disputes with 12 out of 14 countries, right? And uh, in fact, with Myanmar, they resolved the boundary dispute. That boundary was also on McMahon line. So I don't think it's a big issue as far as these 12 countries are concerned. Now, the only two outstanding border disputes they have, one is with Bhutan. And very recently, they've gone for a memorandum of understanding with Bhutan for some three-stage kind of a approach to the resolution of that dispute. But with India, I think uh, in the near future, I don't think uh, uh, this boundary dispute with the India is anywhere in the reckoning of resolution. So if there is any stumbling block, uh, that is India. And this border with India, it does affect uh, uh, China because Tibet still remains uh, a very, very sore point in their strategic calculus. Similarly, the kind of influence that we still have in Nepal and some of the bound, uh, neighboring countries, that still figures out very prominently. So I don't think this uh, border issue in regard to other countries is a major concern for China. In fact, if you look at their border dispute uh, uh, with other countries, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization was actually created to resolve these border disputes. And today with Central Asian Republic, that has become the main conduit of Belt and Road Initiative. And so is that other corridor which is going through Mongolia towards Russia and all. Uh, and they've also bartered some territory with, uh, with Pakistan, the Shakskam Valley they've given to them. That's so I, I don't think uh, border is a major issue. Their big, basic concern is actually this dilemma of two chains of island. They feel totally restrained in the first chain and they feel totally restrained in the second chain. And if, say, the, there is a concert of maritime pause which is brought to bear against China, that for certain is moderate, going to moderate their behavior. So if yeah. deterrence has to work, it has to really work in the maritime space and in the non-linear spaces like outer space, cyberspace, information space, and not so much on the borders per se. That's my response to that. Perfect. I, if I can add, Stephen, I remember that much of the trade uh, uh, passes through the Straits of Malacca. That is a choke point. That is like their coronary artery. If you choke that off, uh, the Chinese economy could come to a standstill. So China's fears are really maritime. It is, in a way, reminiscent of Germany before World War I, which had a narrow coastline but which was starting to industrialize and it needed good, uh, markets uh, for its finished goods. And China is the workshop of the world and China is exporting to the world. And very much like Germany, it is worried that it could be, it could be blocked off export markets and of energy. Uh, so th those of you interested in the India-China dispute, uh, Vikram Sood, the former chief of REW, uh, India's external intelligence agency, and Glenn Carl, a retired CIA man, and I wrote a 13,000 plus word analysis of, of the dispute. And you can go to Fair Observer and read that. Uh, and we are happy to take further questions on it. I will pose one final question and then we will ring down the curtain. And this is uh, for Christopher from Dr. Rosh Roshan. And he says that. Um, Selling a nuclear submarine uh, to Australia, non-nuclear state, is uh, is uh, wrong precedence because now um, China could do the same to its allies, for instance, let's say Pakistan. And um, this uh, this this precedence uh, offers a challenge to disarmament and arms control. So what uh, do you say to Dr. Roshan from a nuclear non-proliferation standpoint? And that is the final question we have for today. Well, no doubt there's, there's cooperation there. Uh, in terms of any sort of nuclear proliferation, and I know the technologies can be adapted, uh, you know, it is, as I understand it, a conventional weapons submarine, but with a nuclear platform. Uh, I do understand the concerns about proliferation 
the Australians themselves decided uh, when they went with the Americans uh, instead of the French for whatever reason that they wanted the nuclear ability. And I think uh, America and, and indeed others in the region saw strategic value in their having uh, these quieter uh, submarines that could stay underwater longer. Um, you know, addressing the proliferation issue uh, would involve, uh, you know, discussions about treaties. But I think the strategic imperative is something that people looked at more carefully in this case, uh, as opposed to the proliferation issue. Uh, I think some people did take uh, some heart that the submarine itself is designed for conventional weapons. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's a value judgment. Thank you. On that, on that note, uh, it has been an honor to uh, have this discussion hosted by General Sharma. We've had Christopher Schell from the US, uh, a man with rich experience who ran for Congress in 2020 and lost. We wish him better luck next time. We have Frederick Grar, um, uh, a geopolitical analyst and expert on the Indo-Pacific, dialing in from France. Thank you, Frederick, for your time. Merci beaucoup. And we've had uh, Admiral Shekhar Sinha, uh, a small town boy who made it big uh, at the national stage, who's one of our great um, uh, geostrategic minds. Uh, and of course, uh, last but not the least, we've had the dapper, handsome, erudite, charming, and wise uh, uh, general chairing our discussion. General Sharma, thank you so, so much. Uh, everyone, before you go, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure you check us out on social media. Uh, choose your choice of poison. As I say, you can follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, and, and of course, you can go to our website and sign up for our free newsletter. Remember, we are one of the few independent nonprofits uh, in the world news space. We provide you perspectives from many prisms. Uh, we believe in a plurality of uh, perspectives, we offer you debate, uh, discussion, uh, and discourse. We are fact-based and well-reasoned. And with that pitch, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a good day, a good evening, uh, and, uh, and uh, good luck with whatever you're up to. Bye for now. Thank well, you happy very Diwali much. To you. Thanks a lot. Happy Thank Diwali, you. everyone. Happy Diwali. Happy Diwali. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.